He said, uh, and this is kind of something that stuck with me, he said, a good recording engineer can make a Wallen sack sound good. And I was like, what's a Wallen sack? I've got to ask about that. <laughs> But that, what is that? The old tape machine yeah, or something? Yeah, yeah. Evidently, it wasn't good, or he would he wouldn't have used that in his. <laughs> I know what a hacky sack is. Welcome to Recording Studio Rockstars. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is the podcast created to help you become a rock star of the recording studio. Hello, rock stars. It's your host, Lid Shaw. I created this show to introduce you to real world recording professionals to hear their stories and learn from their experiences so that you can take your records to the next level and be a rock star of the studio yourself. My guest today is Kevin Ward, a producer, mixer, audio blogger, and teacher who has been making award winning records since he moved to Nashville in 1991, which also happens to be the same year that I moved here to Nashville. Kevin started playing guitar at six years old, but later caught the recording bug at 11 when he discovered that you could take two tape cassette recorders and link them together to record multi-track overdubs. He went on to spend a long career in the studio recording and producing records. And along the way, he created Vine Records, which has won many Dove Awards for the great artists that he produces. His extensive client list includes Vince Gill, Willie Nelson, Judy Collins, Dolly Parton, Boots Randolph, Jerry Springer, Vassar Clements, Sam Bush, the Prague Philharmonic Orchestra, Rhonda Vincent, and Richie McDonald of Lone Star. Kevin then took all his experience and knowledge from years of producing and mixing and decided to help you learn how to record yourself, creating an online coaching program called The Mix Coach. There you will find many courses to teach you how to mix in different styles and genres from rock and jazz to full orchestra and pop country. There's even a complete Pro Tools course to help you really know your DAW before you begin. And what you'll really want to check out, Rockstars, is the Mix Coach Pro membership program. In this course, Kevin delivers a new song to you each month, mix alongside both the pros and your peers, so that you can take your mixing to the next level and learn how to create great mixes across a variety of genres. In Kevin's own words, you don't have to be famous to make a living at this. I'll include links to all this in the show notes, of course, at recordingstudiorockstars.com and directly in your podcast app on your phone. Please welcome Kevin Ward to Recording Studio Rockstars. Kevin, are you ready to rock? Let's rock, ladies. <laughs> I like that, man. It was a gentle rock. Well, maybe Let's we'll, rock. Maybe we'll get into some yacht rock, you know? Hey, it's all good. Um, so, hey, introduce yourself, too, in your own words. Tell us who you are. Well, first of all, what an intro, man. Thank you for – I need to get you to, to write for me <laughs> write for me some because you, you put stuff in there that I – some of which I've forgotten about. But, yeah, I mean, you mentioned it. I got the bug pretty early when I was um, – by this time I was 11, and I had – I'm dating myself here, but I had two cassette recorders, and I would play an acoustic guitar into one and then play that one back and then play bass into the the other one and kind of mix it. And then I would just, you know, by the time I was done, I had three or four or five instruments on it, and I took it to my mom, and, and I said, this is what I want to do. I want to record like this. So ever since then, you know, I've made my decisions based on whether or not I would get the opportunity to to be in a recording studio, I would read magazines back to you know EQ and Mix and all of those magazines that you know I was just a kid. I I couldn't even get my hands on some of them, but I I stored up a bunch of good questions. And <laughs> I was in Asheville, North Carolina, at a studio, and I remember uh, thinking this is my chance to ask a real recording engineer some of these questions. And I remember the question I asked was like. What's the difference between plus four and minus 10? And does it have anything to do with balanced and unbalanced cables? And the guy looked at me like, wow, you you know what that stuff is. He said, do you want, are you interested in doing something like this? And I said, absolutely, man. And he said, well, I'll be uh, leaving for full sale in about in a few months and I need to hire a replacement. Would you be interested? And I said, <laughs> you know, it was like uh, almost uh I, I teared up a little bit probably because, you know, by this time I was I was 20 and I'd been working on it for a while. But anyway, I worked in Asheville at a studio called Crossroads. I got some great experience there. You know, I would record pretty much a record a week 
sometimes more than that. I was just telling my intern that, you know, when I first started, we would cut tracks, 10 tracks on Monday. Uh, we would sing 10 songs on Tuesday, and usually we would mix on Thursday. And sometimes if you had a lot of money, you would spend two days on vocals. That's awesome. That's great. Uh, it just kind of ingrained a, a, a good work, work ethic and a really knowing what was important uh, to people from doing pro- projects like that. I think a lot of people, well, I mean, we can talk about this probably later on in the show, but, you know, I, I realized pretty quick that these people that I was recording probably weren't going to be, you know, dinner table type names that you would mention every night, but they were recording um, with every bit of savings that they could scrape up and their only week off. And so I did, I tried my best not to treat it any less than that, less important than, than them. So I'm glad you brought that up. Cause I remember seeing that on your website and hearing you talk about that on a video. And I think that is so key. I try and teach that to my interns here at the studio. It's something that I only really realized after I created my own studio and started working really with independent artists because you start to see that how truly invested a client is in their music and in what they're doing. And when they come to you, they're really, they're putting everything on the line. Mm -hmm. And when, and when you treat them that way, when you treat your artists with that kind of respect and understanding, it's just, it makes such a difference. Yeah. I mean, it's a, it's a great way to learn and it's a great work ethic to, to, to adopt. I mean, I think a lot of people, you know, when they go into recording, they they just think that they're going to be working with famous people all the time. And and you know, I know I've listened to some of your podcasts, and I know that some of the guys that that you've interviewed, like Reed Shippen, man, what a rock star he is. And you know, but I'll bet you if you ask him, you know, well, I don't know about him. I mean, it seems like you know he just puts out one hit after the other. But guys like me. My claim to fame, I guess, is that I've been able to make a living here in Nashville and really recording, except for the names that you mentioned in the intro, most of your listeners have probably never heard of and never will hear of, but yet they come back to me year after year and get me to you know work on them because I try my best every time to treat their product as important. It's funny, when somebody asks me, what are you working on lately? I don't know if you're this way, but I never can think of what I'm working on lately, <laughs> except for what I just finished working on. And most yeah. of the time, it's like, you know, something they'll say, who? And I'll go, yeah, I mean. Yeah, you know, I, I do. But a, it's important. I do a yearly gig at Bonnaroo at the festival, and mm-hmm. I'll go down and record up to 40 artists in four days. And then somebody will ask me at them, they'll say, oh, man, what was the highlight for you all week? And I'm like, I, I I can't remember who I just recorded. You know, I mm-hmm. I, th- I know the one we just did just now. That was probably the highlight. Yeah. So, yeah, I know what you mean. You get so invested in the moment. And yeah. an, another funny aside with that is, you know, you have that experience of having this intense weekend in the studio and you learn and you get to know all the band members, you know, all five people, all six people, whatever. And then a year later, you just... You have to be reintroduced to those people sometimes because you are. You're just invested in the moment. You know, one thing I, I try to do when I, when I have people come in the studio, I don't try to do this. It just seems to always happen. But I found, you know, back in, in the years in Asheville, before I moved to Nashville in 96, you know, placing the importance, I, I realized that most people, including myself, would not remember the quality of the recording five years down the road, but they would remember the experience. So I tried to make sure that it was an experience that, you know, people think it's funny that I, the first question I asked is like, where are we going to lunch? But man, there's a lot of good stuff that happens over lunch. And, and that's one of the things I missed about Asheville when I came to Nashville. And that is that, you know, everybody was on a team in Asheville and everybody went to lunch together and you talked about what everybody talked about. And it seems like in Nashville, I don't know if you've noticed this or not, but the musicians will go one way and the producer and the artist will go the another way. And then it's like the, the, the studio staff and the engineer will go the third way, unless you invite yourself. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, that's interesting. You know, I, I have a little different experience here, but I know what you're talking about. And I have seen that because Nashville does have, you know, kind of a, Well, I don't want to say factory mentality in in a negative way, but that everybody gathers together in a studio. And like you say, there's session musicians, there's a producer and the engineer, there's the songwriters. And uh, and so they do come together for those four hours and they might go off and do other things. But here, what we like to do is we actually, I I try to train the interns to, uh, 
and I mean this in a positive way, but teach them the importance of keeping everybody together for lunch. It's funny that you bring that up because that's one of our um, policies here is one of us will ask everybody what they want at about 1130. And then the band, they're not thinking about lunch. They're like, are you kidding? We're just getting ro- all rolling. Who's talking about lunch, you know? But what, what happens is they'll finish that first take, the second take. And then right when they didn't realize they were hungry in the middle of the day, food just appears and we'll set it up on TV trays and everybody sits around. And so we don't lose any time because like you said, the value and the investment on the artist part is they're, they're putting everything into being here and they don't want to take two hours off in the middle of the day necessarily. But we, uh, but we do, you're, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm glad you brought it up. You know, that's a cool thing, man. I mean, and, and people, your artists and even the musicians, you know, as, as, um, as mundane, I guess, as it can be just, just playing every day, you know, they'll remember the experience of having food catered in or, or getting to know the artists that they're working for. Because, you know, a lot of times when people come to Nashville, I mean, there could be no bigger star than that studio musician that's playing on the record, you know, and going to eat lunch with them is a bonus. You know what? Um, the intern could be the biggest star in the room. It, exactly. Exactly. So just, it, it, I, I, love, I love to emphasize the experience. Well, so Kevin, can you start us off on this podcast with an inspirational quote? I mean, you've given us a couple already and they come from you. What else have you got for us? Well, when I was in college, man, I, I got um, I got to, somebody gave me a copied tape of a guy named Zig Ziglar. Oh, yeah. And I just, he said something uh, when I was first trying to get started on my career. And I guess this, is, this shaped me a lot, but he says, you can have everything in life you want if you just help enough other people get what they want. And I, I've always just loved that quote, and that's kind of what I try to apply every time that, you know, the experience. One of the things I'm teaching on Mixed Coach and Mixed Coach member is that it's about experience and it's about being the problem solver. I mean, if you can look at yourself, because, you know, I did a, I did a keynote um, at a college last week, and one of the things I said was, a musician and an engineer are not, you know, the, the engineer doesn't wear the pocket protector and the musician doesn't wear the sunglasses necessarily anymore. It's pretty much, you know, we do what we have to do to make music. And a lot of times, you know, the engineer is the musician, the musician is the engineer. So we have to kind of be in the role of being a problem solver, whatever that is. You know, if somebody needs coffee, solve that problem. Or if they're hungry, solve that problem. Or if they need their vocals to sound better than they are and it's not the microphone, if you know what I mean, solve that that's problem so wise. too. I wonder if that's a little bit of a Nashville thing too, because one of our shared experiences here is that we're almost always working with live musicians, real people playing music together with, you know, just really simple problems sometimes, like, where am I going to set my foot? You know, that kind of thing. Like, how am I going to not be (laughs) tangled by this cable? And I think that uh, often we might think that the solution to making a great record is some fancy new piece of gear or some plug-in or something that we don't have, when in fact, the greatest difference between a bad guitar part and a great guitar part might just simply be the fact that you came out and, and showed them that you had another chair to sit in. Yeah. Well, you know, we know what's funny. I actually gave two keynotes last week. The first keynote was to a bunch of uh, um, in, instructors or jazz teachers. It was at the end of a jazz um, festival that they had. And my question was, why aren't you recording more? You know, they all have, are in front of live bands every day. So why aren't you recording? And one of the, one of the you know, in my imagination, one of the holdbacks were I don't have the equipment. So I did something kind of funny. Um, which you may appreciate, and it goes along with what you just said. I've got a mic shop, U47, which is kind of renowned in Nashville as being one of the best new stock, you know, or new U47s you can get. So I took my acoustic guitar and I got in front of that U47, which is sometimes a go-to on acoustic guitar. It just sounds great. And then I took my iPhone and put it right underneath it and recorded uh, the same pass with both microphones. And I put it in my keynote and I said, okay, so which one of these is a $5,000 mic run through a $2,000 interface, then run through a, you know, $1,000 DAW, and which one is the really expensive one and is is recorded on the iPhone. And do you know that both of the people that had the courage to try to guess, guessed it wrong? 
<laughs> they they amazing. chose the iPhone every time. So it's not really the gear. It's the uh, it's the ear. You know, it's it's how you yeah. develop your ear into into knowing what the sound you want. Because one of my mentors, Kevin McManus, I don't know if you know him or not, but he had a studio called Oak Valley. You know, he's still a dear friend of mine. He said, uh, and this is kind of something that stuck with me. He said a good recording engineer can make a Wallen sack sound good. And I was like, what's a Wallen sack? I've got to ask about that. <laughs> The, what is that? The old tape machine? Yeah, or something? yeah. Evidently, it wasn't good, or he would he wouldn't have used that in his. <laughs> I know what a hacky sack is. Well, it probably sounds better than a hacky sack too. <laughs> well, that's so cool, man. Yeah, I was going to say when they when they give you the excuse of not having the the gear, did you say hold your phone up? Okay, there you go. Yeah, you know? exactly. Get everybody in the room to do it, and and I agree with you. I love recording on my phone. Recently, I started wanting to come down to the studio and remove the obstacle of the gear in the studio from being between me and writing a song idea. So I said, well, I've got this app, multi-track app on my phone. I'm just going to plug headphones into that and set my phone on my lap while I play drums and then set the phone on the guitar amp while I play guitar. And I, I, I won't say that it really sounded like a record yet, but it did sound really cool and it caused me to make music. Right, right. Uh, that's that's awesome. I'd, I'd love to hear that. Could you get that to me? Sure, man. I'll send I would it to love you, yeah. to hear it. Seriously, you just got to forgive my attempts at sounding like the meters. That's all. I, I don't quite have the funky groove. Yeah. So you didn't have like Melodyne and uh, Beat Detective on your phone. They don't have that yet. No, not yet. I <laughs> wish they. Well, I don't know if I wish yeah. they would. But I remember the T Pain app where you could make yourself sound auto tune. Yeah. It was pretty cool. I remember. Well, so so Kevin, share with us a, a like a great story about an important failure for you. Oh wow! You know, you've had a you've had a long career. You've been doing a lot of records. What was a time? I mean, somebody watching you now might think, ah, Kevin really knows what he's doing. He knows it all. He's He doesn't have the struggles that I do. Well, man, I mean, you know, when uh, when you told me you would probably ask this question, I've been thinking about it. And I guess it's not, I couldn't think of any epic fails, but I think it's because I fail so much that I don't even notice it anymore. But in the in the effort of getting stuff done and um, you know trying to look make the next guy look better, I just I don't really even take it into account. But I can tell you something. I don't know if you can call this a fail or not, but something I wish I would have um, adopted a little earlier on, and that is I wish I would have I wish I would have thought more like a songwriter because I think we all kind of have that ability inside us. And if you think about it, Lidge, I mean, if you think Nashville would not operate without a songwriter. And and a lot of times the songwriters, you know, they're the people to go to. Those are the people that get the best opportunities. And I wish sometimes that I would have not said when I first moved to Nashville that, you know, even though I believe you should be kind of focus toward one direction. Sometimes you just have to adapt. And I wish on those times where people are having trouble with a line, I wish I would have chimed in and and kind of became more of a songwriter and, you know, creating music from that early, early stage instead of trying to craft it in a later stage. Well, you think it was that fear of the expression, a word is a third? They say, I just heard that recently in Nashville, the idea that if you contribute a word to a song, Somehow you you now own a third of the song. <laughs> well, I mean that that is the case, and you know, you know. It, but we, we we didn't. If can you imagine, like in your first high school band, college band, hanging out with your friends, if you worried about stuff like that, you never would have even picked up a guitar and played your first song. You yeah, know? you know that's that's one of the things I've noticed. You know, in trying to define, you know how what most people's obstacles are into getting into music and creating music. And, and some of it's the you know fact that they don't think they have the right gear. And and some of it, if you do this long enough, of course, you know, uh, you work with songwriters and musicians or creative people, I guess as you say, like us and songwriters. Sometimes we have this savior syndrome is what I call it on my website. Um, in the fact that we'll write one song and go, if, if so-and-so could just hear this song, I know and I used to say it myself, and I think a lot of people define, you know, sometimes they'll do one mix and go, man, I've been mixing on this thing for three years. And I'm like, dude, this is the first song. You've, it's a numbers game. You, I mean, you, you, you don't even realize what you did wrong until you finish the song and, and put it out and call it done. You know, you, I, I'm sure you've heard stuff on the radio where you'd like, oh, man, I wish I had one more shot at that. But, you know, one of the things oh, I yeah. learned from one of, another one of my mentors 
uh, Jermaine Griggs, he said, done is better than perfect. And I'll have to agree. And and one other thing, one other quote, I'm banging up on the quotes here, but uh, Andy Stanley, uh, he's a pastor in Atlanta. He says that experience is not the best teacher. It's analyzed experience that's the best teacher. So until you get the mix done, you can't analyze it. You're always still working on it. Um, Yeah, that's a great tip. I mean, um, there are so many opportunities for us to get stuck on whatever it is that we're working on. And I remember when I was in school and I was surrounded by more bands and, you know, we were all young, I would hear people say things like, well, I'm going to do this, you know, I'm doing my band and it'd be cool if something happens, you know, if something happens, then yeah, we'll, we'll do it. We'll go on the road or something like that. And I always, it always hit me wrong. It was like, I know this is a slight variation of what you're saying, Mm -hmm. but it's that idea that you're going to kind of just do your one thing. And then the world is supposed to come clamoring to your door to, you know, make everything happen for you. You know, that's another thing uh, that, that since you said that, I'll mention this. A lot of people think that they can buy one plug in or buy one mic or set their studio up in a certain area, move to Nashville or, or whatever. And what I teach is that you know, if it were one thing that made you good at what you did, then everybody would just go to Sweetwater or whatever and buy that one thing. And then we'd all be in the same place again. But thank God it's not one thing that you do. It's the thousand little things that you do that if you took away one or even a dozen of them, nobody would barely notice. But it's the it's the hundred or a thousand little things that you do that defines who you are and, you know, whether people like you or not. You know, I'm actually gonna going to rebut that. Okay. I'm going to say that there is one thing. What's that? But we miss it all the time. The one thing is you. You, the individual, you're the one thing that is irreplaceable. And that if you focus on yourself and what you bring to the table and you really, truly recognize it, you see the value in your own work and you believe in yourself, then opportunities really do open up and and start happening. That's true. But, you know, again, what makes you you is a thousand or even more things that your personal experience is what makes you you. So... Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. I, I just wanted to say the word rebut. Oh, rebut. I never say that yeah. word. <laughs> uh, My daughter would crack up if she was like, Daddy, you said but. <laughs> My little girl would too. All right. So now how about a, a, a moment of great success for you? Something where you really felt like things were coming together when you were Man. recording. You know, I had trouble with, uh, with this too because, I don't know, it seems like some some of the things that you do that are big don't feel like successes while you do them. They, you know, nobody realizes, even yourself, don't even know that you're doing it. But I have to say that when I started um, kind of the taking on the, I guess, the role of a teacher and a mentor to mixers and musicians and, you know, studios and things like that, I had to drop the whole secrecy thing. Like, you know, back in the day, even as little as five years ago, some of the big mixers wouldn't tell you. They wouldn't tell you any of their tricks, and it was all guarded. And and, and you knew when you had crossed the line because you would ask something, and they'd look at you like, who do you think you are? And of course, I've never really been like that because I, I, uh, I realized pretty early on that I was responsible for creating most of my own competition because people would come to my studio and go, now, what is this program called? And how much would a Mac cost me? And then the next thing I'd know, you know, about the time it was to do their next record, they'd say, hey, I'm trying to get this uh, microphone going to this. And I, and I would help them through all that. So I guess a moment of success for, for me is when I, I've had a friend come up to me and say, you know, most of what I've learned about recording, I learned from you. And that was such, that was such a, I read a book called The E-Myth. I don't know if you read business books a lot, but I read a lot. And I read The E-Myth. And before I started Mix Coach, I read this book about how to set up a business properly. And one of the things he said was, you know, imagine yourself, imagine yourself in a room with all your friends. They're all very well dressed. They're all talking about you. The only thing is that you are in the middle of the room, but you're, you know, in a coffin, you're dead. What do you want your friends to say about you after you're gone? And I realized that I didn't care if they said that, man, you know, going to miss Kevin and he got such a great kick sound. I can't believe he's gone. I, I would rather them say, You know, I hung out with Kevin for five minutes and he inspired me to do such and such, or he, he's the one that pushed me to do this, or he's the one that gave me the idea to do that. So I guess my, every time somebody comes up and says something like that to me, 
it, it's it's like you're 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 getting there, you know. Yeah, uh, maybe maybe I just want them to say like, oh, you know what? I never got that twenty five bucks back <laughs> from. <it." laughs> yeah, I'll be like, yeah, that, that, that's a good yeah. that's a good thing to say. I don't want them to say this. So, but yeah. Yeah, that's great, man. Um, you know, another thing about the e-myth is uh, the nature of how technology uh, fools us into feeling connected sometimes. You know, one of the things, well, no, let me back up from that. So th the way it isolates us, I guess that's what I want to say. We have our computers, we can all go off. Your, your client who maybe took their computer home now isn't necessarily in the studio with you and uh, sometimes we forget the value of getting together with people mm -hmm. and getting into the studio to play together. And we, you know, we think we might go off and do it on our own. Or we say to ourselves, you know, I can record all, all the parts myself and, and do it. Mm -hmm. And then you do that and, and then you go have lunch by yourself <laughs> and you realize you're like, no, this isn't quite as much fun as being around all my friends. Um, but, you know, and that, that kind of starts to bring us to one of your... Uh, things you created, the mix coach mm -hmm. too, to talk about that, the value of finding places where you can get together with people, even if it is online, just bringing people back together, you know, having that communion as you're working on projects together, mixing, recording, producing. Mm -hmm. I guess I just wanted to throw that in there. Yeah. Um, you know, it, you know, I told you that I went to a college last week and, and taught a little bit. That uh, this one thing that's kind of got me fired up right now. One thing I realized is that as much as you can teach online in front of a camera and like, you know, see people on uh, their Instagram feed and all that kind of stuff, there's something about being in the proximity of somebody. You know, I, I did a blog post on Mixed Coach and it was called something about the proximity effect. And it's not the kind that you get from a cardioid pattern microphone. It was like, you know, one of the ways I got work when I first moved to Nashville is is going to lunch with people. And just from being in the presence of people, puts you in a different category than somebody who they could text or they could email. And, you know, I was talking to someone across the table and I said, there, you know, there's so much being said, even when we're not exchanging words across the table, there's stuff that happens across the table that, that could never happen in any other platform. Yeah, I agree with you. I mean, lunch is, I've said this before on the podcast too, but lunch is my number one place to meet with people. I'm going to have lunch anyway. So <laughs> in fact, I've got somebody that I'm going to be meeting with, you know, having a lunch meeting with after we finish Me this too. podcast. <laughs> and I agree. There is something about the internet that we might be creating ways to teach other people and share from the studio, but doing it by ourselves and creating a video and doing a mix. There might be opportunities where we want to learn from somebody about the studio and we're watching them do a pre-recorded video. But every time I have a chance to do an interactive podcast interview like this mm -hmm. or do a webinar where I'm interacting and there's live q and I really love that stuff. There's something wonderful about just knowing that other people are on the other end of the line. Right, know? right. Well, so tell us about um, Mix Coach Pro because I know that is a big part of what you do there. That's a, an element to it is that there's that community interaction, right? What do we need to know? What should we know about the Mix Coach Pro? And well, and I mean, that? it's a it's a community of guys that want to learn to mix different styles of music, and you know, and like I like I said a few minutes ago, you know, you can't mix one song and really call yourself a mixing engineer. You kind of have to mix a lot of songs. And, you know, I mix a lot of gospel music and a lot of people won't, you know, they may discount gospel music as one genre, but in reality, you know, gospel music covers, I mean, on one record, for example, I may mix a huge orchestra, like a hundred piece orchestra and a rhythm section at the same time, which is a very challenging mix. And then the very next mix may be an acapella song with, uh, you know, 20 tracks of vocals. And then the very next mix may be a bluegrass style with an acoustic bass and all acoustic instruments. And so all of those, all those different genres in one genre is something that I realized that, hey, I know how to, I know the differences between these genres and what this guy wants to hear because he's bluegrass and what this guy wants to hear because he's rock. And I kind of wanted to, you know, be able to impart that on people. So I started Mix Coach member a few years ago, and every month we get a new song to mix, usually something that I'm working on or have worked on. And then I'll, you know, either me or John or one of my other, you know, awesome coaches will go through and do a tutorial and, you know, and then we offer the opportunity to submit that song and let 
one of our guys give you a video feedback, which I think is probably the most valuable part of it is how good the community is and, and the feedback that they give. Because when I started it, again, I didn't I didn't want to hold anything back. So, And I think that is either I've attracted those kind of people that are just generous with knowledge. Because, you know, to be honest with you, I've improved as a mixer f- from surrounding myself with people who are so on fire about mixing. So it's been good for me, too. Yeah, I mean, one of the things I say is the best way to learn is to teach, right? Mm -hmm, Exactly. Well, so now as a member of MixCoach, now let me make sure I've got the term right. It's MixCoach Pro or MixCoach Pro member? Uh, MixCoach member is what it's called. If you go to MixCoach member, you know, you can find it, but you can find it on my website or you can put a link to it if it's easier for people to, to remember, put a link to it on your website too. Okay, I'll do that for sure. Thank you. Uh, so if somebody's a member of that, they are getting multi-tracks of, delivered to them every month. Every, They're mm-hmm. learning about the mix that you do, and they get an opportunity to mix mm-hmm. it themselves and submit their mix to you or one of the coaches right. for feedback. So right. that's very cool. Yeah. I mean, that that's not included in the membership because I wouldn't want to charge everybody for that every month because not everybody's ready to commit to turning in a mix every month. So it, it's a it's a small upcharge, but it's very it's negligible actually for what you get from it. Because I've gotten I was reading an email last night that uh, you know, I I love reading email, but you know, my purpose here, I love reading emails where people saying, man, I learned this because because you put it up here on on Mix Coach. And so hey, that's cool. So you you've created it in a way that you can join as a member and you can get the monthly stuff. But then if you want to take it to another level, you've got different tiers. Right. There's a couple of right? tiers that you can go up. Yeah, actually. Yeah. Cool, man. Now, I know you were also telling me about some great free resources on your website as well for people who are just getting started and want to learn more about mixing. Yeah. I mean, well, I mean, one that I can think of, you know, five things every great mixer knows. I mean, it it's not a tutorial, really. It's really uh, like me sitting down and going through five things that that I think mixers ought to know how to get, you know, how to get work, how to, one thing in particular, and it's toward the end is the, it's called what I call the American Idol effect. And it's like, you know, how regardless, I mean, there's great resources on the web with, you know, Graham Cochran and Joe Gilder and, and some of these other guys that are, you know, doing the, you know, some of the rock stars that you've, you've uh, interviewed, there's great resources out there. But it's very important that you, if you want to be a mixer, that you surround yourself with people that are going to hold your feet to the fire. Because your mom, uh, have you ever watched American Idol on, you know, in the first part of the season where people go in there and their mom has been telling them their whole life how awesome they are? And then <laughs> right. there's this cold rush of cold water when they realize that they're in front of pros now and the pros don't agree with their mom. And I'm, you know, my point is you've got to surround yourself with people that are going to, you know, hold your feet to the fire, hold you accountable, ask if you could do this a little bit better. And that's, that's one of the cool things about, about that. So the only five things every great mixer knows, that's one of the things that we cover, but you know, it's not a tutorial per se, but I have a ton of tutorials on YouTube. I've got a podcast and all that stuff. So there, there's a link to all that stuff when you, I'll send you all that stuff, you know, when you sign up, um, you know, for okay, the mailing cool. list. Yeah. Cool. You know, I'm going to go on a tiny tangent here, but you talking about that process of being in front of pros and then your pros don't see it the way your mom did. Mm-hmm. I, it reminded me of my first experiences here in Nashville. You know, I came here, I was around these people who were very serious about recording. And the first th- thing I did, I think my first reaction was to sort of put myself away a little bit. You know, the stuff that I loved doing before and, and the recordings that I was so excited about, I felt kind of guilty about them being surrounded by so much great stuff. Mm-hmm. And while I think that's okay initially, um, and I and it's certainly great to learn all these great skills from people who are really talented. I find that later on in my career and everything, I want to dig that back out again. You know, bring out the stuff that got me excited about recording music in the first place. Mm-hmm. So I've I've sort of witnessed that it's a cycle. It's like you you start out with excitement, and then you go to school, and you get a little bit quiet, quiet and shy. And in the end, as you learn all the techniques and the tools. Ultimately, you need to like come back out of your shell and really show the world who you are and what your original voice is. You know, I found a quote that Al Schmidt said, and I put it on my on my blog a few weeks ago, and it was talking about you know nobody really buys a record because they like the snare, which I don't know if it's a hundred percent true because I know that I've bought records because of drum sounds and things like that, but. 
And I think it's because the drum sounds made me feel some kind of an emotion. And I feel like the ultimate role of a mixer is to bring out, squeeze out every bit of emotion that you can in a song. And sometimes it's the snare drum, sometimes it's the vocal. And like, you know, I was watching the Grammys a little while ago, this year's Grammys. And I remember sitting there and uh, let's see, it was um, it was when the acapella group and Stevie Wonder was singing. I remember getting misty over that and I was and I and I couldn't help think to myself this is why I wanted to do music because it made me feel this way and I think sometimes yeah. we uh, we almost you know trim it down to a business and all that kind of thing when when the real essence of it is trying to make people feel something and I think you know I tell people all the time the ultimate um, expression of whether they like your song is whether whether or not they move. And it couldn't be a dance. It could be a raised hand. It could be bobbing your head, you know, like that Saturday Night Live guy that did the... Anyway, um, I mean, I remember one time in the right. studio, there was... Um, I was doing a record and there was a there was a short turnaround going into the final course and it was a like a Western thing. It was kind of a um, like a cowboy thing, and, and the hook was and every time, you know, done with a baritone guitar, tw- doubled with a Telecaster, and uh-huh. every time that part came up, I just like took my hand like I had a cowboy hat on, and I went, whoa, <laughs> or something like that, and I thought, man, for a song like this to make me want to move as jaded as I could be, you know, that's that's an accomplishment to get somebody to move. Indeed. I love it when you get excited in the studio. I, I you too. just want to turn the speakers up louder. <laughs> well, so that's all great stuff, Kevin. Thank you for that. And your um, five things that every great mixer knows, mm-hmm. that resource, Rockstars, I'm going to have a link to that at recordingstudiorockstars.com slash five things. All spelled out, right? Yeah, it doesn't even matter. I'm going to put it both <laughs> okay. ways. So whether you type in a five or spell F-I-V-E, just remember recordingstudiorockstars.com slash five things, and that will give you a, a direct download. You can get on on the email list. You can learn about Kevin and uh, and get straight over to his site. So very cool. And then we're going to take a short break here, and we'll come back in a moment for the jam session. Does that sound good to you, Kevin? That sounds good. Hey everybody, it's Lid Shaw, and I want to thank you so much for listening to this episode of Recording Studio Rockstars. I really appreciate you, and I really appreciate your time. And as a way of saying thank you, I've created a special mix tutorial just for you, Rockstars, totally free, called the Mix Master Bundle. With it, you get over two hours of detailed videos watching over my shoulder as I mix a song in my studio. Plus, I give you the free ebook that explains how I recorded the tracks, and you get downloadable multi tracks so that you can practice your mixes, including the Pro Tools session file, using nothing but stock plugins in Pro Tools, all of which you would find in any other DAW, whether you're on Logic or Studio One or Reaper. Maybe you're struggling with trying to improve your mix technique, or maybe you just simply don't have access to multi track files or can't record a full drum set in your studio. I wanted to give you a chance to create your own mixes from full drum drum kit, bass, and guitars recorded in my studio. The song is called American Winter, and it's off my instrumental record, Skadoosh, and it's all available for you totally free right now. All you need to do to get it is text Mix Master Bundle to 33444, and I'll send it directly to your email. Again, that's Mix Master Bundle with no space to 33444. 444, or you can go directly to mixmasterbundle.com, enter your email, and I'll send all the files directly to you. Thanks so much, rock stars. We'll see you guys in the jam session. Cheers. Hey, rock stars, it's Lid Shaw, and I'm back here at Recording Studio Rock Stars with our guest, Kevin Ward, and we are about to jump into the jam session. Kevin, are you ready to jam, my friend? Let's jam. <laughs> all right, awesome, dude. Tell us, when you got started out in recording, what was holding you back initially? Uh, well, I guess it depends on when when I basically consider getting myself re- recording. I mean, because I, I considered myself a, a recording engineer at 11 when I had two tape recorders. But I, I think probably... It sounded like nothing was holding you back at 11. <laughs> well, the, really, the only thing, was, I guess, was just being in the proximity of 
a, a fast growth. And that's, you know, having, like I said before, having people around you that, you know, uh, I think there's a quote, I, I think it's on in the five things every guy makes or knows that video series that we talked about. There is a, a tweet in there that says, you know, if you want to get good, you got to surround yourself from with clients who require more producers that require more, um, you know, people that need more, because as they need more, you you deliver more just kind of by instinct, you know, so being around people um, that that are a catalyst for fast growth, that's important. I like it, man. I like it. And not only that, but my 10 year old daughter just told me she learned the word catalyst this week. So oh, cool. <laughs> another good word on the podcast. All right. So share with us, Kevin, some of the best advice you remember receiving. You know, back in Asheville, um, there was a mentor that I had. His name was Eddie Swan. And, uh, and I remember him saying, if it sounds good, it is good. And I thought, yeah. man, that's, that's, about <laughs> as, uh, that's about as bottom line as you can get. You know, we talked like about that. the iPhone and the U47. You know, if it sounds good, it is good. Yeah, your ears are the final judgment of whether or not it's a good choice. Right. Oh, and I suppose somebody else's ears too, if they're if you're trying to sell it. To well, them. the person writing the <laughs> check, it, their ears do matters a little bit, I guess. <laughs> That's great. All right. Now, how about a favorite uh, recording tip, hack, or secret sauce, something that our rock stars could use right now? Okay. Um, well, there's several things that I that I cover on some YouTube videos, but the ones that I can think of instantly, do uh, you mind if I say a couple? Yeah. Okay. Please. I, I know that the listeners will love to hear okay, some Okay. Well, one thing that I've noticed that happened to me is that if you what you mix last, you mix loudest. So, uh, and I discovered this one time when I was at the sound kitchen working and the client that I was mixing for, we were in the middle of the last song, literally. And they said, Hey, is it too late to get a harmonica overdub on this? And I said, you know, so problem solver here. Uh, no, I'll make a call right now. So we got, uh, Terry McMillan to come in. Do you remember Terry McMillan? Uh, I don't think I've worked he with was, him. Now. He was a um, phenomenal musician. But anyway, I got him to come in. He's one of those guys that just brightens the room just by being there. And nice. uh, so he did his harmonica overdub. And then here I am trying to make this harmonica fit in with the mix. And I'm like, why can't I get this harmonica to sit in the mix right? And I realized right then is what I was mixing last, I was mixing loudest. So I was making the harmonica trump the vocal. So now I teach my guys to mix backwards and make what's last be the most important thing. So in Nashville, usually singer-songwriter town, you know, you want to make the lead vocal last. So I'll mix the drums, the bass, the guitars, and then the keyboards. And then I'll just kind of make sure that's all sounding good. And then I'll put backer vocals and then I'll put lead vocal in there. And that puts everything in the right perspective and it makes you achieve a good balance on a mix really quick. Yeah, that's interesting. I have noticed that when I build the band and I make everything slamming and, and rocking. Sometimes it's challenging to get the vocal to sit out on top, or there's, or maybe I haven't left enough headroom for myself. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I've also noticed the opposite. Sometimes if I just start with the vocal and I mix around that, I might be able to carve out a lot of space for the vocal, but I probably am not mixing the rest of the tracks to be slamming enough. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But so I don't know if that's a helpful response there, but well, um, I mean, it definitely, I mean, the takeaway for sure is like, pay close attention to what happens when you start with a thing or end mm -hmm. with a thing. For well, sure. I yeah. mean, I think if there's any big takeaway is to, is to experiment, uh, you know, preferably when you're not in the throes of having to mix something, experiment with what makes you mix the most consistently, because honestly, consistency is probably the key driver for whether or not you get the next gig or not. Because if they know that, you know, your mixes are, they sound this way and that you're going to mix the next one probably this way, you know, it may be a reason for them to come to you. But if, you know, if you hit it out of the park one time and then you completely miss it the next time, you know, that lack of consistency will probably cost you uh, a lot in the end. I think it was Tom Lord Algae who said to me once, I, I had a chance to work with him, and I think it was him who said this. He was talking about mixing and delivering great product. And he said, you know, if you can mix um, well, you can, people will really like it. You know, if you can mix well a lot of the time, then you can make good money mixing. Mm -hmm. But if you can mix great all the time, then you can make great money mm -hmm. mixing, you know? <laughs> like the same point is like, yeah. it's just essentially that. If you can consistently deliver great quality, 
then that will really just shoot you to the top. And I, let me add just a little addendum to that too. Tom and Chris are my some of my favorite mixers, and yeah. I guarantee you that if you were to watch them. Um, any two days in a row or any two given days, they're they're going to have rituals and routines that they go through. And, and you know, this art, uh, air quote here, if you, this art of mixing is a lot about, you know, 80% or 90% ritual and 10% creativity. And you build a ritual into practice, which is, you know, another reason that I started Mix Coach is that this is a chance for people to practice and get good at something. So when somebody comes to them and say, hey, can you mix this bluegrass song? You go, yeah, I can. And then you've already got templates. You've got, you know, things kind of that you've built yourself. So yeah, ritual. That's, that's huge. That's huge, man. When I've, every opportunity I've ever had to be in a studio or in a situation with a mentor and learning from somebody who's more experienced than me mm -hmm. has been a, a huge leap for me. Mm -hmm. So I totally agree with you. Having an opportunity to come in from all the way across the world and be in a studio with you learning how to mix is going to be a great opportunity for somebody who's looking for that. Yeah. I, I do want, uh, I do have a class like that where people come from, I mean, technically all over the world, although it, it's a weekend in the, in the fall that we do here. It's called the Mixed Coach Experience Weekend, and it's just a combination of uh, us sitting together, listening to each other's mixes, and just being with your peeps, you know, people that yeah. uh, that help improve you. And it, it's something I look forward to every year. This, this coming uh, September will be the third year, and, you know, I'm making plans on launching that right now. Now, do the T-shirts for that say, are you experienced? <laughs> <laughs> they should. Little Hendrix maybe reference. I should, maybe I should get you to on. help me with my T-shirts. You're always I'll, creative I'll, with the T-shirts. I'll be glad to, man. I think I was telling you on our break that when I do Bonnaroo every year, I, I like to print up T-shirts in my very old great friend, Matt Fuller, who played drums in my band. He's out in LA. He does all the graphic design. But uh, this year he he did, it was our 11th year. And so he put a, a guitar knob in the middle of the shirt that goes to 11 from Spinal Tap. <laughs> you had it modified then, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, all right. We got a few more here, okay. Kevin. Now tell us a, a great uh, or a favorite hardware tool for the studio. Something, now this could be anything. You can think outside the box if you want, but something that every time you're in the studio, you're like, boy, I'm sure glad I've got this. This always makes life better in the studio. Well, you know, I, you know, I almost hesitate to say this because I don't want to discourage anybody, um, but I just bought a set of Barefoot MM27s, and that's probably the most expensive thing I've ever bought for my studio ever. But at the same time, while, you know, like I was listening to uh, one of your podcasts um, and it was, oh, who was the last, the Jonathan Roy was, he uh -huh. said something like in his podcast about, it's not about how expensive your speakers are, but just get to know those speakers. I, I, I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, but, I, but, but you, but you discovered that my podcast sounded so good on your barefoot monitors. It really that... did. I thought, <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I mean, it was so revelational because the low end there and it was like, and, and I realized after I got them, I guess that, that, you know, one of the reasons I love to go like every now and then I'll go to, um, a friend of mine, Wayne Hahn, who's a producer, um, we will take a project to Capitol and mix in Capitol, one of Capitol's big rooms, like the C room usually. And they usually have these nice big monitors. And it's so it's not a lot of people want to give a lot of credit to, you know, doing the stem mixing or, or mixing. What do you how do you what's that? Uh, not mixing in the box, but mixing through a console and stuff. Yeah, and I, yeah. I think the biggest thing is the the types of speakers that those studios typically have. And uh, and I noticed that, you know, I was cleaning up a lot of low end stuff and there was a lot of detail that. I was hearing there that I didn't hear. So uh, I went to, you know, I was humbled. I went to John Mayfield, who's a phenomenal mastering engineer right there in Berry Hill. And I took a project that I was working on over there. And, you know, he was listening on a $100,000 set of PMCs. And I was like, man, if I could just hear that in my studio, I could fix it. And then instead, you know, he was tweaking stuff around, N nothing big, you know, a few dozen little things that, that I could have fixed here. So I decided then and there that it was it was about time for me to, you know, I'm, I love NS10s. And I was mixing on, a, I think, a set of Tanoys, old Tanoys and uh, my event 2020s. And 
again, it's not, it wasn't a huge thing. I don't think everybody needs to go out and buy a huge set of speakers, but it did make a difference for me. Yeah. You know, Carl Tatz, a studio designer in Nashville, he does what he calls the phantom focus system, and he'll dial in the speakers mm-hmm. so that it's perfectly tuned for the room. And I've, I've heard many of his rooms, and they sound incredible. I mean, they really I feel like I'm sitting in front of a 20-foot wall of solid granite when I'm listening back to playback. Mm-hmm. But I remember taking a mix that I had done and listening to it on a system like that, and I heard a rhythmic part in the bridge in the low frequency that just didn't even exist anywhere else. Mm-hmm. It was like a musical part to the song that I didn't know was there. Mm-hmm. So interesting, you know, and, and it's true. You can really hear remarkable things. Right. So great advice. Um, sorry to share that with you, rock stars. Uh, monitoring is a really important <laughs> thing. I don't know that you need to go spend $20,000 on, you know, the big, huge monitors just yet. No, but- you know, one thing that uh, that I teach, and this is in the Five Things series of videos, is that really, if you have a laptop with a doll on it and a good set of headphones, Headphones or a set of headphones that you trust and know how they sound, you're in business. You can you can do whatever you need to do. And for the longest time, I got a set of Grado headphones, which are still a little bit more top end. But the Sennheiser or, or the yeah the Sennheiser is it. Uh, 650s are great headphones. I had a set of $300 Sony headphones that I loved, and I noticed that um, Graham Cochran mentioned that um, uh, what's his Andrew Andrew Sheps. Yeah, uh, he he makes his own $100 set of headphones on his laptop. That's just evidence that, you know, what Jonathan was saying is right. We can't all afford to to jump in the deep end of the pool and buy, you know, you know I know Reed, Reed mixes with a nice set of monitors too. Mm-hmm. You know, that will come eventually. But for right now, don't let it hold you back. Just get a good set of headphones. You'll You'll be fine, I promise. Yeah. Well, I mean, ultimately, it depends on the environment you're going to listen back in too. So if you're listening in a place that doesn't have twenty thousand dollars speakers, you know, then maybe the ones you're mixing are are the best representation of how it's going to sound. Right, too. right. Well, so hey, now share with us a favorite software tool, something <laughs> in the computer that's really great. Yeah, I around. keep I keep talking about this, but the the thing when I was talking to the college kids at Casper, they asked me kind of the same thing, and I said, uh, first of all, any mic, and that's when I referenced the U forty seven and. Because, I mean, any studio mic that you buy now, honestly, is going to be about as good as the next one, unless you've just got a lot of money to experiment. Mm-hmm. So, But software, in my opinion, you may roll your eyes, but Melodyne is unbelievable because Melodyne can make a person, if, think about the, it this way, Melodyne can make a person sound better than the best mic the best mic pre, the best compressor. If they're flat, it's just a really good recording of a flat singer. And a lot of times I do I do melodyning and tuning and stuff without people even know it. And here's the funny thing is that when people come to your studio, they don't say, man, you know, he had a U47 and a LA-2A and, and this and that. They don't know that stuff. They just say, I really like the way my vocal sounds here. And they don't know, they don't attribute that to the mic. A lot of times they attribute it to how on pitch they are and how good they sound. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. If you're singing well. Yeah. So Melodyne is an invaluable tool to me. I love Melodyne. I use it all the time. I me was too. just using it this week. I find it's an incredibly powerful tool. And I actually use it the old school way. I don't use it as sort of the new school way. I, um, one of these days I'm going to put together something where I show exactly how I do it. But what I, is the old school and new well, school? Well, I just I just use Melodyne Studio. It's just the multi-track version, and I mm-hmm. import all my vocals into that, and I tune them all separately, and then I bring them back into my Pro Tools session, mm-hmm. as opposed to putting it as a plug-in on each vocal track in Pro Tools. Right. But I do a little bit of both. I do a little yeah. bit of both. Well, that's a great tip. So now how about a resource for the business side? I mean, you know, if we're going to keep doing this, if it's just a hobby, then it doesn't matter. But if we want to be able to make a living at this, we need to know something about how to make it sustainable? Oh, you know, I mean, I, I don't know if I have any business tools that anybody would be interested in, really. I mean, I'm a geeky kind of blogger guy, so I use WordPress a lot and stuff. But, you know, right now, uh, I listen to a guy named Michael Hyatt right here in Nashville. He's a great resource for leaders. And really, you know, if you're a recording engineer and you have a studio and you are kind of at the helm of of helping people with their project, you are a leader. So really be a, a, a good resource. Mm-hmm. But he uses Evernote 
And I've noticed I use Evernote a lot lately since I've been organizing it differently. Like when I find a, a cool video that I want to go back and watch later, I just share it in an Evernote notebook and tag it as read later. And then when I'm sitting at an airport waiting on a plane, I'll just pull up Evernote and, and pull up my read later tag. And, and then I can just read all that stuff because, you know, honestly, there's a ton of stuff in my Evernote that I will never get to, but it's nice yeah. knowing that well, I can find it. Well, it has some other really cool features I know about. So for example, if you're out meeting, meeting and greeting people at clubs and somebody hands you a business card, is anybody doing that still? I guess we're still handing out business cards, right? Yeah, I'll take a picture of it. Yeah, with Evernote, you can just take a quick photo of it, and then it it analyzes it into text that you can search for later. So it's a really easy way to keep your contacts organized. Mm -hmm. This is just the futurist, I guess, in me, but I think eventually social media, Evernote, all that stuff is, so, is going to be so contextual. Is that the right word, contextual? Uh, anyway, that, that you'll have your Bluetooth headphone up in your ear and nobody will know it, and then you'll have your Google Glass on, and then Evernote will say, hey, this is Lid Shaw. You did a podcast with him 14 years ago, and uh, he's got this many kids, and this is where his studio is. And so you can say, hey, Liz, how you doing, man? <laughs> uh, I mean, I, I don't know if I'm looking forward to that or not, but I think that technology is definitely coming. Where I you... can't wait to be a brain in a jar, you know, living on a shelf <laughs> 300 years from now. <laughs> oh, man. So, wait, I just thought of another really cool use for Evernote. What's that? I, I was doing a record, uh, this band is The Twigs. Um, or Twigs, not The Twigs, just Twigs. And, uh, and we just did a record this past year. Love these guys. Great band. I was really invested in this, and I was doing my mixes, and I knew I needed to have my mix notes uh, and come back into the studio to do my remixes later. And I find that a lot of the times I know exactly what I think about a mix when I'm listening in the car and I'm outside mm -hmm. of the studio. And I really know right away I have lots of ideas, but I have trouble capturing them. What I discovered was... If I can remember exactly how I did this, I had the mixes themselves in SoundCloud so that they would play easily on the app on my phone. Mm -hmm. And then I had Evernote open. And if Evernote was the visible screen, now I got to be careful because I'm talking about driving and doing this, but this is the beauty is I figured <laughs> out how to do this without causing an accident. So Evernote was open and it was the screen that was up on my iPhone. And so if I pressed you know, you press the button on your headset and it presses play on your iPhone. You press it again and it stops it. Right. So that would start and stop the song easily. And then all I had to do was just touch the microphone icon in Evernote and I could pause the song, touch it there and immediately speak the notes into Evernote through the same headset and then press the button again to stop the note taking and press it again to start the song. So it was like, all I had to do was just press the button on my headset while I was driving. It was safe enough, right? That's really cool, man. Uh, you know, if, if I can say one more thing, you this sparked something else in me. I use Dropbox a lot for, you know, used to uh, I would burn a CD and take it out to the car, which was, you know, and then I thought about since my home, my studio is in my home, I thought about I should just run a cable from my studio <laughs> through the headphone system over to my car so I can just use one of those cassette Dude, adapters. We're like parallel then, universes, you and I. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, my my probably my most expensive set of speakers is a Honda Odyssey, <laughs> the ones in a Honda Odyssey stock. Yeah. I mean, real, realistically, that's putting it in perspective. The speakers weren't that much. My 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 barefoots weren't that expensive compared to the Honda Odyssey. But I'm using uh, Dropbox. I've got a folder in my Dropbox that I call Listen in Car. And I put it in the sidebar of my computer. So anytime I do a mix, I'll do a, an MP3 or MP4 or M4V or wh uh, whatever that I'm using. And I'll drag it in that folder and it syncs to my phone. And then by the time I can get to my car, I just pull up that folder and all yeah. my mixes are there. And I listen to it just driving around in the car. That's been a kind of a game changer for me. So now here's another tip for you. Uh -oh. Dropbox has recently added a comment section. So yeah. you can listen to it and then you can just ty type in little comment text. But then, then you can't get into texting driving, so you might have to pull over before you type it in. Or you can speak it. You can just hit the little microphone, probably, but oh, then you cut off it. the it's audio. It's getting good. All right. Oh, man. This Sorry, Rockstars. Sucks. We're going way off on a tangent, but I know you <laughs> wanted to know about that stuff. That's the, Those are the kind of tips I've been hoping to hear. So, Kevin, let's, let's make a dash for the finish here. Okay. A couple more questions. This one, and then one last final one. But this is, if you were imagining yourself dropped into a new city, kind of like you did when you went to Asheville or, or came to Nashville, but imagine now you, mm -hmm. you dropped into a new place, you don't know anybody yet, and you don't have any gear, 
but you need a simple setup to record. You got to start with something and you need to find people to record and you need to make ends meet so that you, you can survive and keep doing music and stuff. Mm -hmm. What would you start with? How'd you find folks? And what would you choose as a way to make money to start out? Hmm. Um, well, I mean, if do I have a laptop or do uh, I need to buy well, one? Well, I'm, I'm not giving you a price. I'm not giving you a budget. So yeah, you can buy a laptop if you want. Okay. Well, you know, most people have a laptop. You get a, I mean, you can even do like Rode has a little stereo mic. I'm talking right now, believe it or not, not in some big heavy studio equipment. I'm using a blue Yeti. Um, it's a USB microphone, and it actually sounds pretty good. Uh, I'd probably get a Yeti. I'd get a laptop. I'd get some software like, I don't know, Pro Tools or Mixbus or, you know, something that's not that expensive, something that would do stuff. And I would go and find um, songwriters because, as I said, I think this town and really the whole music business revolves around songwriters. I would either start writing songs or I would find songwriters to help. But the bottom line is be somebody's problem solver. That's that's how I would get business. Don't be somebody's problem. Don't be somebody's <laughs> problem. Be somebody's problem solver. And you can find that. I mean, like if you go to, I don't know, uh, songwriter nights, if you're in Nashville in this parallel universe, if you're in Nashville, you know, there's songwriters everywhere. And then go to, go to church. I mean, there is somebody that is singing at church that doesn't have a recording of them singing and their mother would just love True. you if you could record them. You start out that way. It, it, that's where you start the the hundred or the thousand little things. That's where you would start. Yeah, and that's it's a reminder start. to us all to never forget or take for granted the things that we know how to use. So for example, if you know how to open your laptop, open up GarageBand, plug a microphone in, plug a headphone in and record somebody, you still may know more than somebody else who would really love to have a recording of themselves, but just doesn't even know where to begin yet. Mm -hmm. So there is opportunity out right. there to go out and record people. True. All right. So here we go, Kevin. This is it. This is the big doozy question. Uh -oh, I'm nervous. What's the single most important thing that our listeners can do to become a rock star of the recording studio themselves? Um, I would say... I would say always try to make the guy you're working for look better than they are already. You never want to call attention to some something somebody did wrong or something. Instead, you know, I mean, your pay grade really depends on how well who you're making look better. Because if you think about it, I, I call it serving up. You know, it, so if you're an intern and you get a job in a studio, I mean, your your job as an intern and your worth as an intern kind of depends on how good you make the studio look. And that's how, you know, kind of determines how long you stay around. So if the garbage is running over, but nobody's mentioned that the garbage is running over and you don't take out the garbage, I mean, that's kind of, you're kind of making the studio look bad. So make it look good. If you think about this, um, if you are an intern and a studio hires you, your job is to make the studio look better. If you are an engineer and a producer hires you, then your your job is to make that producer look better and make their job easier than it was before they hired you. Record companies hire producers that make them look better. Mm -hmm. You know, artists find producers that make them look better. So I think if you just kind of adapt the, the mentality of, you know, if you hire me, I'm going to make you look awesome and brilliant. Uh, I, I don't think you can go wrong. Now, what do you do if you're the intern and you hear that the singer is singing out of tune? <laughs> you learn to use Melodon and you use it in secret. <laughs> this is a trick <laughs> trick question for you, Kevin. Exactly. They come in the next morning and go, wow, I am, I am more awesome than I thought. And it's because of the so intern. You don't, just, you don't just walk through the control room with a bag of garbage in your hand and go, hey, guys, I'm, I'm just about to take the garbage out. But before I go, I just wanted to point out that that note you're singing in the other room is sounds kind of flat. You guys might want to work on that. That's that's not the no, thing I to think, do. I think that actually comes natural for interns. <laughs> 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 they don't have to try that. that, that just kind of you have to stop. You have to kind of not think of like that sometimes when you're yeah. when you're interning. That's a that's a lesson. It took me a long time to learn. But I like how you bring up that idea of helping other people look good in the studio. And I remembered an experience that I had when I was starting out in the first studio I was at. I was I was interning. I was assisting there. So I was at the bottom of the ladder and and getting you know trying to work my way up. And there was a guest producer that came in and he flew in from out of town and he was going to work with this band. I knew the band. This guy came in and I know, I, you know, whether I knew it or not, he was, he's nervous. You know, he's getting a shot at something and he was coming in. He really wanted to knock it out of the park. And he started talking to me and I was there to assist him. And I, and I remember instinctively telling him at some part, hey, let me, you know, I'm here to help you out. My job is to make you look 
really awesome in here. And you know, he really appreciated yeah. that. I mean, I wasn't trying to get I wasn't trying to be manipulative and get points. It just felt like a natural thing to say. And, and it is. And I think, you know, I think instinctively people that are able to make a living doing this, that's kind of built into. And if it's not, it should be something that they practice. You know, we're not always, uh, you know, we're not always raised to be, to serve. And, you know, but, but I think once you adapt that mentality that you're here to serve, you know, it's just, things just come naturally. Decisions become yeah. easier to make. Awesome. Well, Kevin, I think it's time for us to wrap up and say goodbye to the rock stars. Thank you so much for coming and being here on the show with us. Really awesome. My pleasure. But let me ask you first how people can find you. How can they follow you and learn more about you? Well, uh, mixcoach.com uh, and, you know, on Twitter is at MixCoach, on Instagram. Uh, I either go by Kevin Ward Music or MixCoach, but MixCoach is where I put all the studio stuff. Facebook is MixCoach. I mean, pretty much anything MixCoach. Okay, cool. Awesome. And if you've come up with something that looks like a blender, you're on the wrong page, so keep looking. No, just <laughs> so, <laughs> or, or a tennis shoe, because I noticed one time it was my coach one time. Oh, it nice. was some kind of tennis shoe thing. Nice, man. Well, you were talking about serving. I was thinking about tennis there, too. <laughs> See, it's just it's just ingrained in me. <laughs> All right. So, and then a reminder to you, rock stars, that Kevin's got a great free resource out there called Five Things Every Great Mixer Knows. And I'm going to make a link for you at recordingstudiorockstars.com slash five things. So that'll just take you straight there. If you can remember that five things, then that'll take you right <laughs> over to it. Uh, use it if you want. Don't if you want. It's all good. Enjoy yourself. Well, Kevin, thank you for being here, man. Really a pleasure. Thank you for the privilege of, of doing this. I love to I love to talk about this craft of recording and mixing. I appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. Um, I look forward to meeting you in person. Here we are on Skype, you know, the wonders of the internet. And uh, I can't wait to come out to Murfreesboro and see your studio. How about lunch? Let's do it. <laughs> okay. You like Mexican? I love Mexican. <laughs> Me too, man. That's what we eat all the time here. Done. Awesome. All right. Cheers. Gracias. See you. <laughs> See you around the studio. See you later. Thanks so much for listening to Recording Studio Rockstars. If you enjoyed the show and want to help make it better, please leave a rating and review on iTunes to help reach more people. You can click directly over to iTunes or go to recordingstudiorockstars.com slash review for an easy explanation. And if you want more free content, all you have to do is text R.S. Rockstars to 33444. Again, that's R.S. Rockstars to 33444. And I'll keep you in the loop with articles, videos, and podcast updates. And I'll let you know about any upcoming giveaway offers, all totally free. Thanks for listening. I'm Lid Shaw, and this is Recording Studio Rockstars. Now, go make great music. Music.